start recording. So we are now, unit two is now done. I have not graded everything yet, so I didn't have them with the end back. I'm gonna wait till I finish grading everyone and then I'll hand it back. Um, it could happen tomorrow, if not by Thursday, the ladies will have those tests done. Um, but for now, we're going to go ahead and move on to the unit D. This is the last unit of the 314 portion. Um, but all of the information here is going to be super beneficial, not only in the rest of the college algebra stuff that we do, but it also will come in handy when you get to pre calc calculus. Okay. Um, this section is mostly going to be dealing with um, fractions, that rational expression section is like the biggest section. And then here you have more rational equations. And then in this section, believe it or not, it's the only part we haven't done yet, which would be the rational inequalities, okay? So it's like basically fractions, fractions, fractions in class three sections, okay? The first section that we're gonna cover is just polynomial inequalities. We have already done inequalities. We had them on our unit C, actually, yeah, our unit C test where you had like a quadratic and then you had an inequality symbol. And the whole strategy with the quadratics was you had to get, pretend it was an equal, right? Pretend it was an equation, solve it like you would a normal quadratic, and then those answers that you get were your like key numbers, right? And then you would set up the number line and test all the little pieces, that whole practice. We're going to revisit it again with polynomials, and then we'll revisit that same process all over again when we get down to this section, which is other types of inequalities, okay? So we will see that whole process again a couple of times in this next couple of weeks. Um, as far as the overview, there's not a whole lot of sections in here, and some of them are super short, especially the 1.8b and the 1.8c, because we're not even doing the whole section. We're just doing that one little piece <laughs> of 1.8, so it doesn't take a whole lot of time to get through that, okay? So because of that, our calendar is really short for this unit. So we're going to talk about the 1.8b, which is the polynomial inequalities. Then we're going to start talking about the rational and expression, uh, rational expression. If we finish rational expressions, then I will shift this around a little bit, and Wednesday we'll talk about something else. But I'm pretty sure we might not be able to get through all of the rational expression stuff. Okay. Not only do I want to cover what's on the papers, but I also want to go into the web assign and look a little bit at the homework and see if there's anything in there that we haven't touched base on in the actual lecture notes, okay? So we're going to go through all of these. I don't want to try to rush through any of it. Again, we have another day where you'll have a, a, a chance to catch up on the homework that you haven't been able to catch up on or keep up with. Um, and then the test would be on that Thursday, the 21st, I believe. So it's gonna happen real quick, just like some of the other 314 um, sections, they just like a week and then bam, there's another test, right? So this was like a week and a half and then we'll have a test. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started on 1.8b. And so I'm gonna do two things. We are gonna cover what's inside these notes, but then we're also gonna go look at the sign and see if there's anything in there that we haven't talked about yet, okay? That way we get full coverage of this particular concept before we move on to the next one. Um, okay, um, so for this section, we're literally just going to be messing with the polynomials and nothing else, okay? So here's the strategy again, just spelled out for us in words, um, but we're going to Put this in practice with the examples of just a little bit okay so it says whenever you're trying to solve a polynomial whether it be a specific kind of polynomial which is the quadratics right or if it be a cubic or anything else fourth power fifth power any kind of polynomial inequality okay the first thing you're going to do is you're going to uh, find all the zeros of the polynomial and to do that, you basically change the inequality symbol, these symbols, right? You just change them into an equal sign. And then you solve that equation. And that's how you'll get the real zeros of the polynomial. Then you're going to arrange those zeros in increasing order from the least to the greatest on the number line. So we've done that before. We would put all of our answers, all of our key numbers on the number line. 
Once we do that, we've created regions, haven't we? Right? And then you would pick test points inside each of one of those regions, test them into the original inequality, and then if it checks out, that would be part of your solution. If it doesn't check out, it is not part of your solution, right? Nothing in that process has changed. It just put in a lot of words, okay? So let's go ahead and practice that with one of the first problems. So here they have a cubic. So it's not a quadratic anymore, but that does not change our strategy, okay? Our strategy is still to temporarily turn it into an equal sign. Turn it into equal sign, and then I wrote the same symbols. <laughs> and then I would have to find the zeros, right? That that fancy word zeros. In order for me to find the quote unquote zeros, I have to have the whole thing equal to zero, right? So I'm gonna have to subtract my 216 over. That will give me the zero on the right hand side that we need. And on the left hand side, I'm actually going to have to factor that. Now we're lucky because the only strategy we have for factoring something with four terms is to do the grouping. That's the only way we can factor things that have four terms. Okay. So I am going to group it. Um, I'll use another color. So I'm going to chop it in half right there. What does this side have in common? What can I factor out from both of these terms? The biggest thing I can factor out from both of those terms x squared. And so then when I factor that out, I'll still need another x to get an x cubed, right? And I'll need the 6 to get a 6x squared. All I'm doing is distributing this x squared back in there and making sure that I'm getting the correct terms, right? That's how you check whether or not you factored it correct. For the second half, I have no choice. I have to bring that minus sign down. <clears throat> if it was a plus sign, I would have to bring that plus sign down. And then what does this side have in common? I don't know. I think 216 can be divided by 36, but let me make sure. Ah, it can. So both of these can then be divided by 36. Can I also factor out an x though? No, because this guy doesn't have an x, right? So I can only factor out the 36. But if you look at what we've got here, we actually have a negative 36 outside the parentheses, right? So a negative 36 times just a regular x will give me that negative 36x. And a negative 36 times a positive 6 will give me that negative 216. And it makes sense because when you're factoring by grouping, shouldn't the parentheses parts match, right? So I do have x plus 6 in common in both of those terms. And if I factor that out, I get the x squared minus 36 equal to 0. Now, you could set them equal to 0 here, but to me, this is not factored completely, is it? Can that second parentheses be factored more? Okay. And so if I factor that one more, I would get x plus 6 and then x minus 6. And so then my zeros, that weird word, are going to be what numbers? Negative six and six. And you get negative six twice, don't you? Right? If I set this expression equal to zero, I would get negative six. If I set the middle expression equal to zero, I get the same number. Right? And then if I set the last expression equal to zero, I get this positive six. Okay? You don't need to list the same answers multiple times. They're going to be in the same location on that number line, aren't they? Going to be right on top of each other. Okay. So they're not going to break up the number line in any weird, special way. So I'm going to mark negative six here and positive six there. Like told me in little paragraphs, right? Always put the lesser one on the left, bigger one on the right. And now I've created three regions for myself, haven't I? So I've got this region here. I've got this region here. Got over here, over here, and over here. How do you write this side, this region, in intervals? 
negative infinity to negative six. Now I know that infinities always get parentheses, but what kind of symbol would negative six have according to the original inequality? Mm -hmm. Because of that bar, right? So because of the equal bar, it will have a bracket. Then the same thing in the middle, it's going to go from negative six to six, but because of the inequality symbol, they will have brackets. And then finally, this section over here, how do I write it? This one always gets infinity. I mean, always gets parentheses. And then that one has to have the same bracket. All the regular numbers will get whatever the symbol says. Okay. The infinities always get parentheses no matter what. Now I have to test each region. So I need to pick a number in each section and test it in the original inequality. So what number can I test on this left hand side? Sure, I guess that works. What number could I test in between negative six and six? Zero. And then what number can I test to the right of six? Sure, positive seven. But what we do is we have to plug them into the original. So I have to say negative seven cubed plus six times negative seven squared minus 36 times negative seven less than or equal to 216. And I don't know if that's true or not. Let's see, parentheses, negative seven raised to the third, come down, um, plus six times negative seven squared, minus 36 times negative seven. And that's all I have on the left side. And I get 203. Is 203 less than or equal to 216? It is. So this part is going to be true in this section. Okay. Now I'm going to test the next number, zero. So I'm going to put zero into that same polynomial. So I actually have to multiply by a bunch of zeros. So I'm going to get zero is less than or equal to 216. Is that true? Zero plus mm -hmm. yes. It is true. So we get true in here as well. And now we check the last one, which is positive seven. Seven cubed plus six times seven squared minus 36 times seven. And that's the same expression, but I'm going to delete all my negatives. So delete, 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 and then get enter. I get 385. Is that less than or equal to 216? It's more, right? So this one's false. So remember, the only pieces that are part of my solution are the ones that said true, right? So technically, my solution would be these two sections here. However, is there a hole at negative six? No, it's solid over here and solid over there, right? So in, essentially what that means is it's just seamless from negative infinity all the way to six, okay? If this had parentheses, then I would know there's a hole and that's what stopping it, right? From continuing all the way to positive six. But for here, because the negative six is in a bracket, this is the same as just saying from negative infinity all the way to the positive six, okay? You can only do that, put them together like that, if they both have brackets here, okay? If they both have the parentheses, like we've always seen them before, you cannot put them together as one. It has to be two chunks because there's a hole there in the middle, okay? But if you try to enter this in a computer, it's going to tell you something like it's not 
improper form or something weird. And then give you a message that's maybe not exactly how you should write. Okay. So for the next one, it's not much different. The process is the same, but of course our answers are never going to be exactly the same because the numbers are different, right? But it's the same process. You'll take that and you'll temporarily turn it into an equation and then find those key numbers, which they're calling zeros now, right? It's the same thing, the same key numbers. So if I take this guy and I equal it to zero, it's already equal to zero, so I don't have to move anybody over. I just need a factor. How would I begin to factor that? Mm -hmm. You always have to take out the greatest common factor. In this case, yes, it's x. And I end up with this equation. And if I'm not sure if I factored it right, just distribute your greatest common factor. You get these again, and you're good. Can I factor that further though? This guy can factor, right? So you get x plus 5 and then x minus 5. And so then if I set each factor equal to 0, what are the three numbers I'll end up with? Zero, negative five, and positive five. Set each one of these guys equal to zero and solve for x, right? So x equal to zero is already done. X plus five equal to zero means I have to minus five over, right? Which is where this one came from. And then x minus five equal to zero means I have to add five over, which is where that guy came from. Okay. Once I have those zeros, we start drawing our little number line. Now I have three of them this time. So I have to put them in order. So negative five is going to go first, then zero, and then positive five. And that creates four regions now. So I've got from negative infinity to negative five. And does it need a bracket or a parenthesis? Yes, there's a bar here. Then negative five to zero. Then from zero to positive five, and then finally from positive five to infinity. <coughs> so then now let's pick some test values. Which test value do you want to pick in this region? Here. And then what about in here? You have four, okay. And then over here. Sure. And over here. Sure. Those all work. Are all those numbers in those particular regions? Yeah. I could have picked negative one, right? Or one. There would still have been a region, right? As long as you pick something in there, it doesn't have to be a specific number you'll still get the correct true or false at the end, okay? As long as you don't use these guys, yeah, exactly. It does have to be a number in that region, and don't use the endpoints. You are correct. Okay, so let's start testing these guys. So we've got negative 6 cubed minus 25 times negative 6. Know about that, so let's go see. Negative six cubed minus twenty-five times negative six. I got negative sixty-six. Is that a true statement? Then? No, this one is false in this region. Now let's try the next test value. So I'm going to go here and I'm just going to change my sixes to the fours. And I get positive 36. So is this one 
a true inequality. So we got true for this middle section. Let's see if there's any other sections that are true. Now we're going to test positive four. I'm going to come back to that line and I'm just going to delete all my negatives. And I get negative 36. So that is not greater than zero. So this section is also false. And then let's check the last section just to see if that might be true or false. I'm going to go back there and change all these guys to six. Positive six. And I get 66, but positive this time. And that is very zero. So for my solution on this problem, I only have two sections that actually came out true. And that is from negative five to zero. And then from positive five to infinity. Those are the two sections that came out to be true. Now, can I connect those into one interval? There's a whole chunk of graph that's missing, right? <laughs> so you can't just connect them like the way we did the last time. There's a whole piece in the middle missing. Okay, well, that is pretty much all I have for the notes. Let me go into the web assign and make sure that there's nothing in there that's too crazy. I haven't seen yet. Every now and then, web assign will like to throw a little curveball in there. Most times people mess with me about it. <laughs> Some people just figure it out by themselves. It's good. Uh, well, let's go make sure. Yeah, so this one's not really much. It has four terms. It already has a zero, right? So when you turn it into an equation, you're just going to do that grouping. Literally just like our first practice problem. Okay. It'll have different key numbers, but it's the same process, right? And when you set up your intervals, these will not have brackets, right? because there's no bar, okay? Same thing for this one. It's also like our first example. Um, it's actually a lot like our first example because we did have to move that number over, right? To make it equal to zero. And then we did the grouping, the full process, okay? This one is also the exact same. However, my suggestion for number three is instead of moving the 54 over to the left-hand side, because the x cubed is negative, I would prefer when you change that to an equal sign for you to move everybody over the right hand side. It will turn that x cubed into a positive x cubed point. Okay, and it'll be easier to factor it that way. Okay. This one is a lot like the others. So once you move that over, you'll be able to factor it by grouping. Um, this one is going to be a lot like our second example. So it's already got the zero. You just need to factor out the GCF and then factor what you've got left over. In this case, I think what three and an x squared, that would be my GCF, right? And then I would end up with two x minus three. Is that right? And of course this thing, well, they don't want to do it. So if I were to factor that, I would have this, right? But I'm actually supposed to turn that temporarily into an equal sign, aren't I? And so if I set this factor equal to zero, what do you get for x? Zero. If I set this factor equal to x, what do you get for x? Three over two, which is actually one and a half, right? One point five. So I should have something marked at zero, and then I should have something else marked at one and a half. And I do here, so more than that here, though, that's a negative being marked. More than likely, just knowing what the zeros are, this is probably going to be my answer, okay? But for you, I would definitely check it. 
Notice that they didn't combine it into one interval. Why? There's parentheses around the zero, right? And when there's parentheses, you can't turn it into just one seamless graph, okay? Only the a bracket there to put it together. And then you wouldn't see the little parentheses at all in the axis, okay? Um, this one's pretty much very similar to that one. They just don't have multiple choice for you. You actually have to graph it. Um, this one is a lot like the one we just did. And this one, it's already factored for you, isn't it? That one's nice, super easy. What are your key numbers then? Mm -hmm. Positive two and negative five. If I set this parentheses equal to zero, you get positive two. And if I set this parentheses equal to zero, you'll get the negative five. Okay. So you're right. And then just test your intervals. And it's nice when they already have it factored because testing it turns out like super fast. You can get it real, real quick. Um, same thing here. What are going to be my two key numbers? What happens if I set this guy before the fourth power? Just the base. What happens if I set the base equal to zero? You just take x by itself and you take it equal to zero. What do you get? Zero. And then if I take the x minus nine and equal it to zero. So I'll have a dot there and I'll have a dot at positive nine. And then you just have plus two intervals. There, right? You get the idea. I don't know why they didn't do this over here because you have a graph, right? You have to check a number in there. So make sure you plug in a negative number to figure out whether this side shaded or not. Then pick a number in between. And then I guess pick 10 to check the other side. Um, this one's the same thing. Question though, what happens if all your regions come out true? Yes, your answer would be all real numbers. Right, if every single section is true, 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 all across the board, right? What if they're all false? Then it would be the solution to the empty because there is no answer, right? If all of them are bad, then nothing works, right? So then you would say it's the empty solution. So that's there just in case that happens. <laughs> and then also here, right? If the answer is no solution, you have to click on this little button, right? If the answer turns out like all the sections are true, then you essentially just have a solid black number line because the whole thing is colored in. Okay. You wouldn't even need a marking dot to just click the draw and color the whole line. Okay. But I just want to make sure we talk about that in case that happens. That didn't happen to us, but it could happen somewhere in all of this. Okay. So that is. 1.8 again, not anything too crazy because we did practice this process with the quadratics, right? So, and with the quadratics, we were factoring also. So, it's not much uh, super new in that regard. However, we are going to go into something that's a little bit different than what we've seen so far, and that's the rational expressions. So, rational expressions are fraction expressions. They're just basically where you have x's in the denominator map. Okay. So there's a lot of different things that we're going to do with these expressions. So, one, we have to know how to find the domains of fractions, which we kind of have already done before. We talked about that already, right? So, that part's not new. But aside from knowing the domain of rational expressions, we also need to know how to simplify them, which basically means to reduce them. We also need to know how to add and subtract them, and we need to know how to multiply and divide them. Okay? We even need to learn how to reduce what are called complex fractions. Because when you have fractions within fractions, okay, how do you make that less complicated, right? Um, so those are all the different content that you see here, finding domains, simplifying, operations means multiply and add, um, divide, and subtract, right? So there's lots of examples for that. And then we do have a couple of examples for uh, complex fractions, okay? But our goals are to be able to find domains, simplify, do all of those four operations, and then simplify the complex fractions, okay? We may or may not be able to finish it all today. We're just gonna go and see how far we get, okay? I do still wanna go into the Levisheim 
and talk about that a little bit before we finish out with this section. Okay, so if I happen to finish the note part, but I don't get to go examine weather sign, that will start next. The next class we're starting with looking at weather sign. Okay, we're not just going to skip the weather sign for this section. We definitely want to look at it. I'm pretty sure there's a lot of questions on this one. Okay, so the first thing we need to know is the domains. A lot of this is redundant because we have already explored some of this. We already know that with polynomials, um, with polynomials, all polynomials, the domain is what? All real numbers, negative infinity to infinity. When you had radicals, that put a restriction on it, didn't it? You had to say that your radicals inside stuff had to be greater than or equal to zero. And then if you solve that, you said, oh, well, x has to be greater than or equal to two, which is exactly what they're saying here. The domain is the set of real numbers greater than or equal to two, right? And what about fraction? A polynomial we already know, right? That's just negative infinity to infinity. They say all real numbers here. Those are things we already know. We already even know a little bit about fractions. What do we say that? It was for fractions. You said it was all real numbers except wherever that denominator was equal to zero, right? And so in this case, it's where x minus three equals zero. And so that's why they say all real numbers except when x is equal to three, right? So this is nothing new. We've already done this before. Um, we've seen it a lot actually. So we're going to jump into the simplifying, okay? So you can have all kinds of polynomial expressions. Every single one of these is considered a rational expression because they all have x in the denominator, don't they? If I had this, this is not a rational expression, okay? Because it can be written as just some number times x and it, okay? So this is not a rational expression. But as soon as you have a variable in the denominator, it becomes a rational expression. Okay. Just in case somebody reads this later, it's like, what is that on the side? Okay. okay. So in order for us to simplify fractions, we already know the process. Normally, and I think it's on another page. But if I had this problem here, if I wanted to simplify by it, normally we've been saying divide both numbers by three, right? And that's how you simplify it. But I'm gonna show you how to simplify it without using the division, okay? You can simplify this by breaking it up into its factors. And so notice that if I factor out the common factor between both of those numbers, it looks like this, doesn't it? Are these equivalent? All I've done is just factored it. It's just, we never called it that back when we were doing it with numbers, okay? Then these two guys actually reduce, and that's where you end up with one fourth, okay? Except in the past, with the numbers, we've been saying, well, divide this by three and divide this by three, and that's where you get the one fourth, okay? You can do that with numbers. But when I give you expressions with a bunch of x's and x squareds and x cubes, do you really know what's going to go into that, right? Do I know that x plus 2 is going to go into the big expression? And do I know that x plus 2 is going to go into the other expression? Probably not, right? So our process is going to be this process. Whatever our polynomials are for the top and the bottom, we're going to factor those polynomials. And then if they have anything in common, those are going to reduce, right? And whatever is left over, that will be our simplified fraction. Okay. So let's go see them examine this. So, like, if I were to look at this, I would not be able to know that x minus two can be divided into this and the bottom. I just wouldn't be able to look at that and know. Okay. So that's why we have to do that process of factoring. So what they did is they took this expression and they factored it, right? The factors of 12 that subtract to give me four are gonna be six and two, but since it needs to result in a positive four, that means that the six needs to be positive. 
and then just double check it. This times this is negative 12. This plus this is actually four, so it's factored correctly. The bottom is not a trinomial, so the only thing I can do is factor out the GCF. So they factored out the three and they got X minus two. Once you have everybody factored, they see these two are in common, so those reduce, and you just have the X plus six at the top and then the three at the bottom, okay? Now, you do also have to remember that when you cancel these factors, you are going to have this statement here that says X cannot equal two, okay? Now, I noticed that when they write this statement, they usually only write the, what is it called? The number that they cancel. So they only write this statement here on the side for the factors that they cancel. But I, if you notice later in the notes, I'm gonna modify that, okay? Because I actually need to take any time that a number was in the denominator, a factor was in the denominator, I should be taking all of those out of my domain. Because none of your denominators can ever equal zero, right? Here, there was no other factor, okay? So I'll show you an example in the next section. Dun, dun, dun. So here we go. This is the one, one of the ones I was talking about. So they've taken these two expressions and they're multiplying. And you have to remember how to multiply regular fractions. If I have one four times two thirds, how did we multiply that? We literally just took top times top, right? And then bottom times bottom, and we got that. And if we needed to reduce it, we would put it in its factors, right? Two times one, two times six, the two reduce, and then I get one six, right? It's the same process for these. The cool thing is, is that you actually factor them before you multiply them. And so then this happens naturally, okay? So if I take an expression here, you've got this fraction times that fraction, and the only way to do it is to multiply this times this and this times this. However, if I sit here and start trying to distribute everything, you're gonna get this super long polynomial and then I'm gonna tell you to factor it, right? So that you can see if it simplifies. Don't torture yourself with that. Don't expand it real large and then have to put it back, you know, in its factor form. Just put it in its factor form now and then whatever happens happens, okay? So if you take this top expression here, 2x squared plus x minus six, and you factor it, you should end up with this if you factored it correctly, okay? If I take this denominator and I factor that, we should end up with this. Now this process, just this process, from one step one to step two, might take you a while, right? Because you're basically doing four mini problems that you did on your first test, aren't you? Right, in your first test, all I did was say factor number one factor number two, factor number three, right? But now you got four of them you gotta do and that's just the first step, okay? So that's why I can't mention if you wanna practice your factoring because there will be a point where it has to come out faster than normal, okay? Otherwise you're wasting a lot of time just to get this one step, okay? If I were to factor the numerator, first I would have to factor out x, and then once I'm done, I can factor what was left over, but eventually you would end up with this expression here on the top. And the same for the bottom. If you factor out the GCF, 2X, you actually end up with just 2X minus 3. So once you have this, you can reduce. My biggest tip to you when you're reducing is you can only reduce one top with one bottom ever, okay? So if you see a bunch of like X plus twos all over the place, remember only one of the top ones can cancel with one of the bottom ones. And that may mean that you'll have some extra X plus two somewhere, okay? So notice that they have a two X minus three up here and a two X minus three down there. So they did go ahead and wipe those out. If I were to set that factor equal to zero, you do get this three halves that they're omitting, okay? Now, what else can I factor? I can actually factor this bottom X minus one with this top X minus one. And if I set X minus one equal to zero, that's where they're getting this number that they're saying you can't plug in, okay? Then they'll notice there's an X here and an X there all by themselves. So it is a factor because isn't this two times X, right? And as long as it's multiplied, it's 
literally called a factor, okay? When it's added or subtracted, it's not, it's called a term, right? But this whole thing is multiplied by that. So this whole thing is a factor and that's why it cancels with this factor, right? So be careful, this little X guy can cancel with this X guy because both of those X's are factors, okay? They're being multiplied. If you set X equal to zero, you get this other restriction, don't you? Okay. Now, all I have left though now is the X plus two, the X minus two, the X plus five and the two. Normally we don't write the two at the end, we write it at the front, right? Now I'm just mentioning that also, what do I have in my denominator? I have an expression down here, don't I? And if I set that expression equal to zero, I'll realize that X can't equal negative five either, okay? So that's what I'm saying. They'll give you this information for the ones they factored away, but it's also included in whatever's left, okay? Because your domain cannot have a negative five either, okay? Now, they didn't give me an example of dividing, but I wanted to make sure that we had an example of dividing, okay? For dividing, I don't know if you remember, but if I had this expression, in order for me to divide, I keep the first fraction exactly as it was, and then I change it to multiplication, and I actually split the second fraction over, okay? And then when I multiply top times top and bottom times bottom, I get this, and that doesn't have any common factors, so it doesn't reduce in this particular problem, right? Let's double check to see if that's actually right just to verify that the process is correct. Um, fraction. It won't put, um, it won't put this symbol in there, it puts that symbol, but it's the same thing. It's this fraction divided by that fraction, right? And it gives me three eighths, okay? So this is the correct process to divide fractions manually, okay? So I'm gonna apply that same process to this problem. So this is the problem they gave us, you know, this polynomial here, this polynomial there, divide it, that polynomial there, and that polynomial there. So my first step for me, some people do two steps in one here. I do one first and then I'll do the flipping. Me, I like to factor everybody first, just like I did on this problem, right? Factor all the pieces first and then go from there. So that's all I did. I took this numerator and I factored it into X minus two and X minus two. Both multiply to give me x plus four and combine to give me negative four, right? The bottom one, all I did was factor out the common factor x and I ended up with x minus one. Over here, I factored the difference of squares. Down here, I factored it and negative one times negative two is plus two. Negative one plus negative two is negative three, okay? So far, it's just factoring. Then I applied that rule from up here. So notice that my first fraction stayed exactly as it was. I didn't do anything to it, right? But then I changed the division into multiplication and then I flipped this one over. So notice the factors are different now, right? The minus one and the minus two are now up top. And then the minus two and the plus two are now down here, right? And so then I'm canceling. Now I chose to cancel this X minus two at the bottom with that X minus two at the top. I could have chosen this X minus two instead, or this X minus two instead, right? Because there's a whole bunch of them at the top. It doesn't matter which one you pick, just remember you can only cancel out one X minus two because there's only one at the bottom for to wipe out one of the tops, okay? Don't cancel out too many of them, okay? One bottom, one top. So I just chose to do this one. It really doesn't matter. If I chose to do the middle one, aren't I still gonna have two of them? Right? If I chose to wipe out the guy in the front, I'm still gonna have two of them, okay? But the X minus one over here does cancel out that X minus one as well, doesn't it? So I'm left with the X minus two, both of them, this X and the X plus two. And so they're gonna automatically put these two in because I canceled out an X minus two. And what do you get when you set X minus two equal to zero? You get this positive two. Right? Then the other factor we canceled out was the X minus one. What do you get when you set X minus one equal to zero? You get positive one, right? 
these are the two restrictions that the computer is always giving me or this paper is always giving me. But I also take the restrictions from the answer. In the answer itself, I know that neither one of these guys can be zero either. Okay. So x cannot equal zero. And if I set this guy equal to zero, I'll say that x cannot equal negative two either. Okay. And so these are all your domain restrictions. Some of them come from the factors that we're reducing, and then some of them come from the final answer. Okay, this is where you know, the computer makes different. I tried to explain it <laughs> my way in later. Okay, for them, they say here's the basic definition of adding and subtracting fractions. Okay, so they're just telling you that if you have a fraction and you have another fraction and you're trying to add or subtract those, you basically do like this crisscross thing. I think I saw somebody draw it like that. Looks like a TV, right? Okay, and so you're basically taking A and D and multiplying those together, B and C multiplying those together, and then at the bottom, B and D get multiplied together. Okay, and that's all they're doing. Why are they doing that? Because that's the exact same process of getting the common denominator. If I don't know what these denominators are and I need to have a common denominator in order to add two things together, then all you have to do is take this guy's denominator and multiply it top and bottom. Take that guy's denominator, I think I said backwards. This guy's denominator, top and bottom, and then this guy's denominator, top and bottom. What does that do? If I multiplied by D here, I would get AD over BD. And if I multiplied by B's here, I get CD over BD. Now, they have the same denominator, don't they? So you could write the whole thing over that common denominator. And don't I have AD plus or minus CD, right? Which is the exact same thing that they have. Okay, but where did that come from? It came from the process of them finding the common denominator. Okay, if you're the type of person that, oh, I've got a rule, let me apply it, then do that. Take this rule and apply it. And that's what the computer does. If you're like, no, I need to see what's going on behind the scenes before I go apply something, then you just find the common denominator for the fraction together. Okay, so for me, when I saw this problem here, my brain does not automatically go to this, okay? They do, but mine doesn't, okay? So what I did instead is I went through the whole process. So what I did was I took this x minus x over x minus three, and I multiplied it by this denominator top to bottom, right? Then I took the other fraction, two over three x plus four, and I multiplied it by this denominator top to bottom. And what I ended up with was x times 3x plus 4 minus the 2 times the x minus 3. And then these two would both have the same denominator, wouldn't they? So over that same fraction. Now for them, they just jump straight there because they say x times this guy is this expression. Negative 2 times this guy is this expression. And then if I multiply the two guys together, I get that expression. Okay. So they, they did that little TP thing. Okay, so they're wrong with doing it that way. You can do it that way. And then from there, they went ahead and distributed their x and distributed their negative two, and they got this. Combine these like terms right here. They got positive two x. And then typically you would want to factor this to see if they can um, if this guy can reduce or if this guy can reduce. But I'm thinking that that cannot factor. So the factors of 18 that have to add, they give me two that doesn't make Well, if they were, no, because if they were both negative, that would give me a positive, right? But then they would give me a negative here if they were both negative. And if they're both positive, how are they going to add to give me two? These numbers are too big, aren't they? I don't think four works, five doesn't work, and six is already on the list, right? So. None of those numbers are going to add to give me two, right? So I try to factor it, but it can't factor according to the 18 minutes it doesn't factor. So then that's why they just left it like that. And if I had to restrict my domain, did I ever cancel anything? Did I ever simplify by canceling factors? No. So I don't have any of those restrictions, but I do have to say 
x cannot equal 3, and x cannot equal negative 4 thirds, right? What happens if I plug those numbers in there? We're going to get zeros in the bottom. We can't have zeros in the bottom. Okay, what are we doing now? Oh, they're saying the same thing all over again. Okay, what they're saying here is if you have to add three fractions together, you really cannot do it the other method. There's no little rule when there's three fractions involved. Okay, it's just not. So you cannot apply that definition when you have three. Now, however, you can get tricky over here. Um, they went ahead and did it, right? They said the LCD is 12. So what do I need to make this a 12? I need a two. What do I need to make this a 12? I need a three. What do I need to make that a 12? I need a four, right? So they said the LCD was 12. They made them all have 12 at the bottom. And then they went ahead and combined the numerators and got three over 12. They reduced that by three and they got the one fourth. However, you can still do it the other way. I'm going to show you how. If for some reason you do have to add three fractions together and you're struggling with finding the common denominator, what you can do is remember your order of operations. Order of operations says if we're adding or subtracting, we have to go from left to right, right? So what we do is we have to do these two first. Once we have that answer, We'll minus two thirds and do the whole process again. Okay. So what I can do is I can do the little TP thing. What do I get when I do one times four? Four. What do I get when I do three times six? Eighteen. And what do I get when I do six times four? Twenty-four. And so then that gives me what? Twenty-two over twenty-four. Can I reduce that at all? I can reduce it. What can I reduce by? Two. Mm -hmm. If I reduce this by two, I will get what? 11? 11. And if I reduce this one by two, I'll get 12. So I finished that whole process. Reducing is part of that process. So I did the whole TP thing, I added, I reduced it, I'm done with that first ex two expressions. Now I can do that same process with the next two expressions. So 11 times 3 is 33, 12 times 2 is 24, and then 12 times 3 is 36, right? What is 33 minus 24? I get 9. What can I reduce both of these guys by? nine. So then you get one and you get four. So my final answer is one four. Is that the same? Okay. So they're telling me basically like if I have three or more fractions, I'm screwed. I have to do it this whole new way. But that's not true, is it? Okay. If there's three fractions, you don't have to do, learn a whole other method. All you have to do is apply the one method you know twice, right? Okay. Now, before we get into our little practice problems, we're going to talk about the last concept. We've been talking about all of them, and we haven't gotten to any practices yet. Now, there are two methods to solving complex fractions. So notice that you have this big bar, but then you have a smaller bar, right? That means you have a smaller fraction within a bigger fraction, okay? The same thing on this side. We have the big fraction bar, but then we have two smaller ones, right? So we have two fraction expressions within a fraction expression, okay? Both of those are considered complex fractions. What you want to do is you want to be able to turn both of those into just one fraction where you have some kind of polynomial or expression and some kind of polynomial or expression, okay? That's how you simplify complex fractions. Get them down to look like a normal, regular fraction, okay? 
So there's a few ways. This is, to me, this is a long way, but this is one of the ways, okay? So first thing you do is you basically add or subtract each one individually. So they took the numerator. What do you get when you do two times the divisible one? You know, this like three over one? So if I do the TP method, two times one is two, X times negative three is negative three X, right? And then what do I get when I do X times one? Just get X. The same TP method over here. So one times X minus one is what they've written there. And then this one times that one is the minus one you see here. And then one times X minus one is just gonna be X minus one, right? Then from there, they went ahead and simplified this numerator to this, the x stays the same. They went ahead and distributed this one and then combined the like terms and they ended up with this expression. And then there's nothing to do here, it's the same expression, okay? Then what they did is they rewrote this division symbol. Instead of writing it this way, you can say the top divided by the bottom. And we already know how to deal with division of fractions. You just keep the first fraction exactly as it was, change it to multiplying, and then flip the second fraction over, okay? And I noticed none of these guys have anything in common to be able to simplify, right, to reduce them. So you just end up with these two expressions at the top and those two expressions at the bottom. Now, why do they say x cannot equal one? Because didn't I have an x minus one down here. So really this should say from this here, I have X at the bottom, so X cannot equal zero. I have X minus one at the bottom, which means X cannot equal one. And then now after I'm done, I also now have an X minus two at the bottom, don't I? And so X can actually not equal positive two either. So there's more restrictions than the ones that they told me about, okay? I just want to keep pointing that out in case they ever ask you for the domain after you've done something. That's strategy one, to me, that's a long way. So there is another strategy, and that has to do with being able to identify the LCD. Even if you can't figure out what the LCD is, the lowest common denominator, just use a common denominator, okay? And it will work exactly the same way. So I might not necessarily need to find the lowest common denominator. I just need to find a common denominator. And the easy way to find a common denominator is to multiply all the denominators together, okay? So if I looked at this fraction, now it wasn't given to me like this. They're taking it from here, but this is not good for me because that's not what I started with. What you started with was this expression. That's what we started with, okay? Then they combined this to one fraction and that to one fraction, and that's what they're trying to go, oh, no, they have it right here. Um, it is the same, they just put it in parentheses. Looking at all of these denominators, what do you get when you take X times one times one times X minus one? What do you get when you multiply all of those together? What does this give you? This x and then the x minus one, right? So this is your common denominator. It happens to also be the lowest common denominator, but that's not necessary. It's just a common denominator. What they're gonna do with that common denominator is they're gonna multiply it to every single term. So you're gonna take your common denominator and you're gonna multiply it to this fraction, you're gonna multiply it to that fraction, multiply it to this fraction, and multiply it to that fraction. Essentially what you're doing is you're taking the common denominator and multiplying it top and bottom. However, because you have two terms in the top, don't you have to distribute the common denominator to the top? And then because you have two terms in the bottom, you have to distribute the common denominator to the bottom. So you are just multiplying by a really weird, convenient one, okay? But you've got to distribute it to every term in the top and every term in the bottom, okay? So what I've done is that here. I don't like what they're doing. 
So what I've done is I've taken that expression that they gave us and put the common denominator times every term, okay? This X will reduce with that X, leaving you with just two times X minus one. Um, here, nothing canceled, right? So you just have negative three times X times X minus one. These can at least be multiplied into negative three X, right? But you still have to multiply by the X minus one. Here, no denominator to cancel. So you will end up with what's one times X? Just X and then the X minus one, right? Then here, the X minus ones cancel. So you have negative one times X, which is just negative X, okay? From there, I went ahead and distributed. So distribute the two, distribute the negative three X, and then combine your like terms, which are only these two guys. And I put it in the correct order. Okay, at the bottom, I did the same thing, distributed the X, combined my like terms, and I have this at the bottom. Now, did I cancel any factors? I canceled an X up here, didn't I? If I set that equal to zero, I get X not equal to zero. I also canceled over here an X minus one, didn't I? So when I cancel that, I get X cannot equal one. When I'm done, I have this. I can factor that. If I set that not equal to zero, I can factor out an X. And then I get X cannot equal zero and X cannot equal two, right? But I already said that X could not equal zero, right? So the only new restriction I have is that X cannot equal two as well. Okay. So don't forget about your restrictions. Now they did it, they did it like this. They combined these two fractions, remember they combined those two fractions into one fraction and they combined this fraction into one fraction. And so they did that little TP thing and got this, did the TP thing and got this, and then now they're applying the LCP. So to me, they're like mixing two of the processes together to do this, and I didn't like that. I like, if you're gonna go through the TP thing and then flip the fraction and do all of that, then go for it. If you're not going to do the TP thing, then you just need to do the common denominator thing, okay? But you do have a choice. To me, this is faster, but if you like the other way, and that comes to you naturally, then stick with the other way, okay? Um, this one is talking about simplifying. Oh, gosh, this is going to come in handy a lot in calculus. I don't even think I have enough examples of that in the homework for you to practice it enough. Well, at least you have seen it. <laughs> a lot of this stuff is like, it, you need to have seen it once before so that when you see it a year later, you're like, oh yeah, I kind of remember something about that. That's the goal, okay? Just to get you to kind of remember some stuff. Okay, if you can remember it thoroughly, fantastic, but if not, even just a little bit, we can, we can work with that, okay? So they're saying that if we're going to factor expressions with negative exponents, it's just like factoring um, without the negative exponents. If I'm going to factor this, how many x's could I factor out from all three of those terms? x to the what? x to the three. Because you always go with the lesser exponent, right? Because you know that that one has three in there, that one has three in there, and that one has three in there to take out, right? It's a little bit more, it's, it's easier to conceptualize when they're positive. When they're negative, it throws people off a little bit. But you have to remember the process, okay? How would I get the new exponent here? What do I do with the six and the three to get this exponent? Uh -huh, subtract them. So then that becomes three, right? And what happens when you do four minus three? Get a little one, right? Which we don't write. And then when you factor when you minus three minus three, you get zero, right? And again, we don't write x to the zero ever, right? You just write the constant all by itself. Okay. It's that same process even with the negatives. It's just with the negatives, it's a little bit tricky to figure out who's the lesser number. Okay. For instance, these two here. You've got this expression 3x to the negative 5 halves and 2x to the negative 3x. 
It's telling you the lesser exponent is negative five halves, but how do you know that? It's the one that puts you further in the negative, right? So the higher the negative number is, that's the lesser value, okay? So between negative five halves and negative three halves, this one has the bigger negative value, which means that that exponent is smaller than that exponent. Makes sense too, because on the number line, here's negative one, here's negative two, here's negative three. Negative three halves is over here and negative five halves is over there, right? Isn't that one lesser because it's on the left, right? So always, always, always go with a bigger negative when it comes to act, figuring out who to factor out. Now, when you're factoring that out, they're gonna put the guy with the bigger negative on the outside. And then what happens? You're supposed to take this exponent and subtract the exponent you're taking out, aren't you? But what happens when you do that? This actually turns into a plus, doesn't it? And what's negative five halves plus five halves? It's just zero. So you actually end up with three X to the zero. What is anything raised to the zero? It's a one, that's why there's a one there, okay? What about here? If this turns into a big fat plus, what is negative three halves plus five halves. That would be positive two halves, right? Which is just one. And that's where they're getting this one exponent from. Okay. So I'm gonna do this problem my way. If I had this expression, I'm gonna factor out the one with the bigger negative. If I factor that out, don't I just end up with the three, right? And then if I factor this one out, I am gonna have to do my calculator, negative three halves take away negative five halves, and I get X to the one, and that's it, okay? So you don't have to write so many steps like they write it, but you do, you do have to go there. Now, they do tell me that if you have a negative exponent, we do need to apply our exponent rules, what does it mean when it's negative? Mm -hmm. It has to go in the denominator. And so then this becomes X. It becomes a positive, but now it's downstairs, right? And so notice my final expression is the same as their final expression. Okay, okay. so when they're doing a complex fraction and it has these weird these weird exponents, between, I see the same expression with exponents. So I do have that expression in common, right? But when we have an expression in common, we have to use the smaller exponent to factor it out. So what would be the smaller exponent between these two guys? It would be the negative one half. Um, and then, actually, I don't even like the way they do this problem at all. No, no, no. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna factor that out, the negative one half, and I'm gonna use a bracket because I don't know what I'm gonna end up with. Now, notice that that expression's in parentheses. If I were to take this same expression and put it in parentheses, what exponent could I put there that keeps it equivalent to what it is right now? What exponent could I put right there? Could I put a two? No, because then that's squaring it, right? Now you're putting an extra one. What should it be? Not three. Were there three here? How many was here? Just one. So just put a one. It's gonna come in handy later, okay? So, and I only did it because this happens to match what's in those parentheses. If it didn't match what was in those parentheses, I probably would have left it alone. Okay, but let's go for it. I have this expression here. I need to take out this mean. So in my calculator, I am gonna end up with four minus x squared, but with what exponent? Let's see. This positive half exponent minus this negative one half exponent. 
I actually get an exponent of one. Okay. And it makes sense. If I were to multiply this times this, wouldn't I add the exponents together? And I get this guy. Okay. Now I'm going to factor it out from here. Well, isn't it just going to make this completely go away? And I'm just going to have x squared. Right? And I factor it from this term. This times this will give me that term. So I factored it correctly. Now, the reason why I mentioned it is because these are the same, aren't they? They can reduce. But when you're reducing, you have to reduce by the lower exponent. So between negative one half and one, who's the one with the lower exponent? The negative one half. So this one will wipe out completely. But the other one won't. I just have to minus that negative one half. So what do you get when you do one minus negative one half? You get three halves. And then here, it's just a one exponent, so I don't really need to write it. And there's no coefficient, so I didn't really need those parentheses anymore. Okay, but if I add the x squared, don't those two cancel? So I just have four over this expression here. Okay. And that took me what, one, two, three steps, and they were doing four steps over here. I'm not even gonna bother figuring out what the heck they were doing over there. I don't like it, I'll do it. Okay. Okay, we're finally, finally, finally into our um, practices. So, what is the domain of this expression here? Is that a correct statement? All real numbers except where the denominator equals zero, right? Then we just have to figure out what the heck is the denominator zero, right? Can that be factored? Does anybody know how to factor it? And so then if I set each one of those guys equal to zero, we get negative two and negative five, right? So then my answer is gonna be all around numbers, except those two guys. If I were to have to put that in interval notation, because sometimes it will ask me for interval notation, which one of those numbers comes first on the number line? The negative five is on the left. Ah, I'm trying to squish it in there. <laughs> but it's only a hole at negative two and a hole at negative five. Everything else is included. So I have from negative infinity to negative five, even in between negative five and negative two, and then I have everything after negative two, from negative two to positive two. Okay. If they wanted me to put it in a notation. Now, what is they want us to go back and simplify. So how do you simplify this one, part A? Do these guys have common factors? Yeah. 
they name anything that they have in common? X squared, what about a number? They're both even, right? We could start with two. If we realize that it can keep reducing, then just keep reducing, okay? But they are both even, so I'm gonna try to take out a two X squared. Let me see, 78 divided by two is 39. So this would be 39 and an extra X to make Q, right? So two times 39 is 78, X squared times X would be X cubed. Now here I already have the X squared, but two times 15 is going to give me 30, right? So then these common factors will cancel and I'll be left with 39 X over 15. Unfortunately though, 39 is not reduced with anything. Oh yeah, it does. And we'll both be reduced by Three. So then this becomes 13x and this becomes 5. And now that cannot be reduced no more. What about B? I don't think the top is not going to factor. There's nothing in common, right? And it's not a polynomial, really. It's just a little binomial, no exponent. So if I were to take that, I would have to leave the numerator alone. But can you factor the denominator? What can you factor out there? No, you can't factor out five from this. You can factor out. Eight, uh huh. You could factor out eight. You could factor out four, but that's not the biggest, right? So we have five minus x. Will those reduce? Can I reduce these like this right now? They're not exactly the same, are they? Here's my hint to you. These are not in order. Write them in order before you start. They're not in the right order. Aren't my x is supposed to be written before my constant, right? So this can be written as negative 8x plus that positive 40, right? And then now we know that when we're factoring out the GCF, if the front term is negative, aren't we forced to factor out that negative? So yes, we do factor out the eight they have a common, but we actually should have been factoring out the negative eight, okay? And when you do that, you'll get a positive X in here, and you'll actually get a negative five in there, won't you? And now do they match completely? This whole thing matches with this whole thing, so they can reduce. You still have a negative eight in the denominator. What happens if everything cancels in the numerator? You have not zero. Everything can always be multiplied by one and still be the same thing, right? So if I had an x minus five by itself, couldn't I write that as one times the x minus five? Is that same? Yeah, right. So when you cancel this guy, you still were left with that guy, right? Okay, now I'm just gonna fix that because nobody likes negative at the bottom. Just write it on the side and you're done. Okay, the last one has probably got a lot more factoring to do, but does anybody know how to factor that numerator? Got it. X plus eight and X minus six, good. Anybody know how to factor the bottom one? Those multiply give me eight, but then combine they give me nine. Yep. 
And then now that everybody's back, or does anybody reduce? This top with that bottom will wipe each other out, right? So all we have left is x minus six on the top and x plus one at the bottom. You can ask me anything about the restriction, so I can even go there, right? You can put the thing. Okay, this one wants me to subtract. And it really doesn't matter whether it's a plus or minus in the middle, but this one has a minus in the middle. It's just two fractions, isn't it? So I'm going to apply that little PP method. I don't know how it starts to be called the PP method, but ah, it looked like one when I drew it, right? So <laughs> that's why I keep calling it that. So we're going to do these guys across, right? It's going to be x times x minus 1. And then these guys across a minus sign, and then two times x plus six, and then the bottoms together, right? Essentially just putting them in parentheses right next to each other. And then from there, it's just a matter of simplifying that numerator. Leave your denominator alone. So it'll be x squared minus an x minus 2x minus 12. If I combine my like terms, I get this. Now, usually you would want to factor that numerator to see if it cancels with anything in the denominator. But I don't even think it factors. Where's everything on the list? So that's it. Okay. None of these are going to subtract to give me three, are they? If I look at all the factors of 12, none of them subtract to give me three, do they? So then this guy cannot be factored. So it just stays like this. But please do try to factor it. Because if for some reason this can be factored and it has one of these factors in it, this cannot be the final answer. You have to put the simplified final answer. Okay. So always try to factor it and see if it'll reduce. <coughs> okay. This one is a complex fraction. So remember, I told you just multiply by a common denominator. Do they already have a common denominator? They do, don't they? What is that common denominator? X. So if my common denominator is X, this is already just one giant term. So I'm going to multiply by X. This also is one giant term, and I'm going to multiply by X. When I do that, those are going to go away and just give me this. And when I do that down here, those are going to go away, and it's going to give me this. But I do need to see if that can reduce. So we should try to factor this numerator. How would we factor that numerator? Mm -hmm. Difference of squares is good. So x plus 5 and then x minus 5. And does anything simplify? Mm -hmm. This is squared though, right? So it's essentially like there's two of them, isn't there? Right? And so we can take this one and wipe out one of the bottom ones, but we'll still have an x minus 5 left, right? And in the top, we still have an x plus 5. And this is what I kept mentioning. You can reduce or simplify factors. So what if this whole thing multiplied by something else and this whole thing is multiplied by something else? Here, you cannot cancel the fives or cancel the x's, right? Because that x is not multiplied by anything and either is that five, right? They're being added. It's not the same, okay? So don't try to reduce this. 
I had somebody tell me the answer was zero. I had somebody say it was one. Somebody told me it was negative one. And I'm like, nope, 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 just one of those. So, so quite Okay, let's see how much time do we have? We have like a few, a few minutes. So let's go look at the homework and see what that's going to have. Want to make sure we're um the session pool has expired. Oh, click on that one. So the quotient of two algebraic expressions is a fractional expression. Quotient of two polynomials is a rational expression. Okay, fractional expressions with separate fractions in the numerator and the denominator are both complex fractions. That's when you have fractions in the top or fractions in the bottom, right? Um, would be considered complex fractions. So just looking at this one, what's the domain? All real numbers except what? If you set that equal to zero, what do you get? Not negative six. Positive six. That's me. Let me go to this guy real quick. So if you take this guy and set it equal to zero, I could minus six over, right? But I still have negative x equal to negative 6, right? That's not x by itself. So I do have to divide by negative 1. So you do get positive 6. You could have also just added the x over instead, right? And then you get that 6 equals x, right? So either way, though, well, we got to get positive 6. So then for that one problem, our domain would be all real numbers except positive 6. So it should be this guy right there. Okay. But notice that the negative six is in there, tricky, right? So be careful with that one. Now here, it's the same thing. They got all these numbers here, so I don't know which ones are the actual answers. But let's go look at that one over there. Uh, that was number three, number four. I only care about who? Do I care about the top? No, it's all real numbers except for where the denominator equals zero, right? So I only care where the denominator is equal to zero. And what would be those factors? How would I be able to factor this? Mm -hmm. And so what factors of 14 add give me nine? Seven and two. And then what was the sign factor? Positive and positive to get that positive sign, right? And when I multiply those together, I do get the positive 14. So when I set this one equal to zero, what do I get? And when I set that one equal to zero, we get negative two. So it should be all real numbers except for these two guys, right? Which is this one right here. Now, we just did one like this, so I'm not going to do this problem. We literally just did one like that, right? Okay. This one we also did. What was the trick with this bottom? I think we had 40 minus 8x on our. What do we have to do first before we start a factory? Yes, we have to rearrange those, right, so that they're in the right order. So make sure you put negative 4x in the front and then the positive 36 in the back, okay? So for number six, make sure you rearrange that before you factor it out. And when I do factor it out, I'm gonna have to factor out that negative four, right? Because it'll be a negative in the front. All the time, if you ever have a negative in the front of your polynomial, you have to factor that negative out, okay? I don't have a choice, <laughs> you have to. Okay, here is basically difference of two squares, right? And then you've got the y plus seven that's gonna cancel one of those, aren't you? That was really easy. Aren't I standing up with y minus seven? Right, because that's the 
one factor for difficult. This one, I would rearrange that first and then start doing your GCF and then your factory. Let's actually try that one. Let's do number eight. 15y plus 6y squared over 8y plus 20. That, this one here, just wrote it down. So I do want to rearrange it always. If it's in the wrong order, make sure you put it in. It's called the ascending order, but it's basically the highest exponent down to the constants. Okay. The bottom is good though. It does have my variables and then my constants, right? What could we factor as a GCF from the top two numbers? Sure, why? Any numbers though, as well? Three? Yeah. So then we get 2y plus 5. Is that correct? If I distribute this back in, do I get these two things? That's how you check it. Make sure that that times that gives you this, and 3y times 5 gives you this. Okay. What do these two guys have in common? Four. And so when I factor out the four, I get two y coincidentally to plus five. Double check it. That times that is eight y. Four times five is twenty. So it's good, right? Can anything reduce the two y plus five? The whole factor. And then can the three and the four reduce? No. I tried, but so you can't. So you just end up with this. Okay. So I already know that one. Three, Y. This one we did have an example. You literally just factor the numerator, right? Back to the denominator, and we get lots of practice with that factor, right? And if they have one of those guys in common, cross those out, and you'll be left with something over something else. Okay. Now, here, there's a trick though. This one, what needs to happen to it? We need to rearrange that one. Let me write it down. Okay, it came out, my hand didn't want to write down right, so it came out a little weird looking. Like the worst person to touch you, my body just goes to <laughs> start moving. Okay, so I do have to rearrange the bottom. So I have to put the negative x squared in the front, then the negative 4x, and then the positive 21. And because there's a negative in the front, I have to take out that negative. Is there anything else I could take out while I'm doing this? Do these have a coefficient in common, a number in common? They don't, right? Some have no number, doesn't it? <laughs> Do they have x's in common? This guy doesn't have an x. They have nothing else in common other than that negative. So you can usually write the little invisible one there. So this will turn into positive, this will turn into positive, and this will turn into negative, right? If I distribute that negative back in, doesn't it change all of them back the way they were? Okay. But I am still left to figure out the factors. So for the numerator, I think I do have to use three and one, but what will the signs have to be in order to get negative two? positive one and negative three. And then here, I am gonna have this negative one on the outside, but I do wanna try to factor that. Are there factors of 21 that will subtract to give me four? There's some two common numbers that multiply give me 21, seven and three. And those actually subtract to give me four, don't they? 
So seven and three, but what are the sign need to be? Um, plus seven. Yes, plus seven and negative three. And then do they have anything in common? Mm -hmm. So those can wipe out and you end up with X plus one at the top, X plus seven at the bottom. And we don't like minuses at the bottom, right? So just put it in the front. Okay, I think we're almost at the end of this section. So I do have to really the only guy I need to factor is this guy, right? But because it's division, what should I be doing with this fraction? Right. Make sure you flip it and then factor everybody and then cancel everybody. Okay. Now this one. You can do the TP thing. Let's do it because that one has these things backwards, but I don't think it matters. Um, number four. Six X minus one X plus E plus minus X. Actually, do we need to do the TP thing? We don't. Then they already have common denominator. They do already have the same denominator, right? So I don't need to do anything other than just combine my like terms on the top and bottom. So the 6x minus the x gives me 5x, and then the 1 minus the 1, both guys have both, right? That one wasn't too bad because it did already have the common denominator. I think it was tricky in there to see if you recognize that it already had a common denominator. Number 13 is the one where you have to actually do the TP. Yeah, the CPs do not have the common denominator, do they? Okay. So let's go ahead. I want to do both of those 13 and 14. So X plus 6, and then number 14. We'll talk about that one. And then we'll even do, it's 15 the last one. This one is literally just like a problem we did in these stuff. Okay, it's the same thing. What's the common denominator there? So once you multiply by those x's, you get that guy over that guy. Just factor the difference of squares, cancel which can. Okay, but I do want to do these three. I don't know that we'll have enough time to do all three, but we'll just go until we get to 945 and then we'll stop. But at least we have a game plan for what to, where to start for the next class. Okay, so for number 14, we are going to apply that little cross multiplying thing. So I'm going to do x times x minus 1, and then minus 8 times the x plus 6, and then the two bottoms together. So then it's just a matter of distributing all of that. And then combining those like terms. Now I would try to factor that. I just don't know that it's going to. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, do any of these numbers subtract to give me nine? Because I gotta subtract, right? Because if one's gonna be positive and one's gonna be negative, right? They gotta subtract to give me nine. So any of these hairs track to the sign? No, right? These will give us 47, 22, 13, what, 8, and then 2, right? So none of these are going to work, which means it cannot be factored. And if 
they can't be factored, then I can't reduce it, right? Okay, so for 14, we'll do 14 and then I'll do 15 the next time. Okay. 14, we're going to do that TP thing again. So 5 times dx plus 2, and then 4 times dx squared minus 4 all over these two guys together. Now if I distribute, I get these terms. And if I combine my like terms, I end up with 4x squared plus 5x minus 6. Now I do not know if that can be better. It might. So let's see, this times this is 24. Squared of 24 is 4. So 1, 2, Do any of those subtract to give me five? Three and eight, right? So I'm gonna just have to do this on the side. So it's gonna be four x squared plus eight x and then negative three x, right? That'll give me positive five x in the middle. And then if I do my grouping, what do these two sides have in common? Or these two terms on this side have in common? 4x, and so I'm going to be left with an x and a 2. I have to put the minus sign. What do these two guys have in common? 3. And so if I divide this by negative 3, I get x. And if I divide this by negative 3, I get positive 2, which makes sense because they're going to be the same, right? So we end up with x plus 2 times 4x minus 3. Now, normally I would factor this. You're supposed to factor that, right? It doesn't matter in this case because this guy actually will cancel with that one, right? Can it cancel with the other one that's hidden in here? No, it can only cancel with one of them, right? So there's really no point in factoring it. But if that happened to not be the same as this, you would have to break this up into the x plus two and the x minus two so that you could reduce it. Here we got lucky because it does reduce with the other guy. Okay. And you would try to factor it, but you can't. All you can do is factor the bottom. You cannot factor the top. So it doesn't reduce. And either one of these is okay. The computer will take either one. They're both the same thing and they're both reduced already. Okay. Okay, we'll leave number 15 for the next time. It'll help us recap the TP and then repeating the TP process again, all right? We'll do that for the first thing and then we'll go into the next um, section. Next class period won't be the whole class period. <laughs> we haven't had one in a while.